what have y'all thought about this series on prayer? I went back yesterday and I listened to Pastor Steph's message again from last week. And I was here and I took notes on it the first time. And I went back yesterday and listened again and I got more notes out of it. I mean, just what God has done through these messages, it's, you can never be a Christ follower too long and not learn something, okay? It's ne you never get to the point where, yeah, I've got all this. No, you don't. If you have, you've closed yourself off. But, uh, you know, we have, we've had several different messages in this series. You know, we talked about uh, simple prayers, then we went to intentional prayers. Uh, we had impossible prayers. Uh, Pastor Bunk talked on dangerous prayers, and this was a book that we read as a staff uh, by Craig Rochelle. And if you don't know who he is, he has a great leadership podcast, and uh, we, we discuss it a lot in our staff meetings. But when we got to this book, I don't think I like Craig Rochelle too much after reading that book. It's like, this is a little bit too challenging for me. So I'm glad that uh, Pastor Bunk uh, gave that message. But really, it is a great book. But sometimes when you get stretched like that, you kind of want to bucket a little bit. But uh, then Pastor Steph uh, came back last week and talked about persistent prayers. And how many of you know that you can never be too persistent? Amen. You know, our, our prayers, it's lots of times it just becomes a point of convenience for us. And that's when we kind of slip into a dangerous area. And we don't want to be like that. Uh, I want to tag on a little bit to what she talked about last week. But what I'm going to talk about today is future prayers. And I, I want to sort of uh, go through that a little bit and kind of explain what I mean by that. And uh, I, I want to talk to you first, uh, first of all, let's, uh, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 3. You may think, well, why, why are you starting at a place like that? But Genesis 1, 3, you know the scripture, it says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Very basic scripture. But if you think about it, that is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. He spoke, and he created light. And you think, yeah, that's great, you know, we have light today because of him. Well, what you need to understand is what he spoke into being is still going on today. You know, there, there wasn't a, a finite end to when God said, let there be light. It didn't reach some extent, and then it stopped. The universe is still expanding today because of what God said. Amen. I mean, that is still going on. Think about that. Those words were so powerful that when he spoke them, they continued on, and they will continue on forever and ever and ever. Scientists have discovered that the universe is constantly expanding, and it came from that one thing that he said, let there be light. That to me, that's still just, it blows my mind that he did something like that. But here's the good thing. He also taught us how to do that. So that's not limited to what just God said. He taught us through his word how we can do the same thing by what we speak. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. You know, the sounds of our words, if you think about them, or our, our prayers, our prayers that we speak, they never die. Yes, you know, just through the law of entropy, the words that you speak, the audio, that will die. You know, words that were spoken in here back in 1986 when we opened that, this building here, we don't hear those words anymore, but the actions that were created by those words are still going on. So good. The reason for that is, you know, when that word was spoken, it was spoken out of the, out of the natural realm by our, 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 our mouth creating that word, but all that did is it passed off into the spirit realm, the kingdom of God, and that's what allowed it to continue. You know, if you read in Revelations chapter 5, they talk about the prayers of the saints being in these giant bowls that they just are collected and accumulated. All these words, all these prayers that have been spoken by people uh, over the centuries. And, uh, you know, for us to understand that our words never die, it kind of puts a, it makes you stop and think for a minute, whoa, what am I saying? What am I going to speak out of my mouth that I know is going to be going on forever and ever and ever? Makes you want to be very careful, doesn't it? Yes. And so we need to be careful what we're saying, but we also need to understand that what we're saying is going to continue. It's not going to just have an end to it. Now, let me clarify something here. I really think there's two types of prayers. Lots of times you may pray something for an event. Let's say that somebody, you're believing for somebody's healing, so you're praying for that event or that particular occurrence of that prayer to take place. You're believing for somebody to be healed of cancer or something like that. Maybe you have a, a financial need and you need a miracle, so you need a particular 
event to take place to answer that prayer. So sometimes we do pray for an event, but lots of times we're just praying to start a process. You know, a process is something that goes on and on and on. It's much, much different from an event. And lots of times when we pray, we're just basically initiating the process when we pray that prayer, okay? And that's what I'm going to talk about more today. Um, You know, if you go to Isaiah chapter 55, it says, this is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It always produces fruit. This is God speaking and this is through the prophet. I will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere that I send it. You know that when he's speaking that through the prophet, he's also speaking that for us, that we have that same ability and that same power. He's saying that we have the ability to do that. E.M. Bounds, which has written some unbelievable stuff on prayer, if you ever have a chance to read any of his uh, writings, it's pretty amazing. He said, God shapes the world by prayers. Prayers are deathless. They outlive the lives of those who uttered them. Man, prayers are deathless. Prayers are deathless. They keep on going, and they produce fruit, just like he was saying in Isaiah 55. Our our words are producing fruit. Another way you can think of a prayer is what you are actually doing is you are speaking a prophecy about some particular thing. You are speaking it into being. You're prophesying about it. Just like God uses the prophets in the Old Testament, when we are speaking prayers, we are doing the same thing. Amen? Amen? We are prophesying over a certain situation. If it's something you're believing for uh, a family member or a loved one, you are prophesying what is going to happen. You know, lots of times the things that we pray, and this is the frustrating part for us because of being human beings, our human nature, is that lots of times our prayers or our answers to our prayers, they don't fit our timeline. You know, we have some predetermined time in our mind that that certain thing has to happen. And how many, of you, how many of you have prayed things before and it didn't fit your timeline? And you got pretty frustrated and you got pretty upset because it didn't fit your timeline. Well, we have to remember something. We're praying, if you can imagine the front of this stage being a timeline, lots of times we're praying and we're just looking at a small piece of that. And we're saying, I'm praying from here to get an answer here. And what we have to do is we have to think about how God looks at everything. He looks at it from the end back to the beginning. So So we are seeing just a small window of that. He's seeing the whole thing at one time. And he understands where that answer needs to fit in in that timeline. Okay? We don't. We might think that we do, but we actually don't. And so we need to understand that although his timing is different, and lots of times I say he's never early, but he's not late. You know, that, that for us in our, in our own mind can be a frustrating thing because lots of times what we, the way we think is so finite, but he is infinite. And because he knows the big picture, he can bring that answer at exactly the right place that we need it. Amen? Amen. You know, lots of times when we're praying for something, and now I'm talking about where you're praying for a particular process to take place, when you're praying for something in the future, You know, you're starting a process that will eventually bring the desired result, but you don't know when. And this is where I'm going to go back to what Pastor Steph was saying last week. We've got to be persistent in our prayers. Because it doesn't meet your timeline, you don't give up on it. You've got to be persistent in praying for that. You've got to pray over and over and over that you're going to get that desired result. You know, if there's two people in this world that I've learned about uh, prayer from, Uh, The first one would definitely be my mother. She's not here today. She wasn't able to make it. Um, And the other one would be Pastor Judy. Uh, Because I've seen both. It's not just what they said to me, but it's how they prayed and me watching that. Uh, Just a little bit of my story from when I was younger. Um, uh, My mom and dad, when they got married, uh, they were not saved. Uh, My mom got saved uh, when I was very young. I guess about four or five years old. And uh, so she started praying for my dad that he would come to know the Lord. And uh, he was definitely not going that direction at that time. And uh, she prayed for him, and eventually he came to know the Lord. And then we as kids, 
uh, we were also saved at a young age. I was very thankful for that. I was saved at the age of seven. And uh, so growing up in a household like that, I've, we, we would get together and we would pray every night. We always had Bible study and prayer uh, in my younger years where we would, uh, we would read the Bible and then we would pray. We would pray about different things, whether it was in the family or somebody that we knew. And uh, that was just a regular thing for us. And my mom would walk around the house during the day praying. She would have women's groups. So they'd come and pray at the house. And uh, she was always a person of prayer. Well, one of the things I specifically remember is her praying for all of our relatives. I, I actually wasn't born in Texas, sorry. Uh, I did get here at four years old, so I've lived here almost all my life. Uh, I originally am from Pennsylvania. I lived in a little Amish town called Enon Valley, and uh, that's where a lot of our family was from, and a lot of them are still up there, and uh, none of them knew the Lord. So my mom started praying for them, and the, the great thing about it was it was something that was a regular thing. I mean, it was, there was hardly a day that would go by that I don't remember her praying for our relatives. And little by little, you would see different ones that would come to know the Lord. And she'd just keep praying for them. And it was just like, it was almost like you could just check them off a list of all these people that she would pray for. And I remember when she prayed, she just wouldn't say, oh, God, I pray for the salvation of all our relatives. She would name them individually as she was going down this list. <clears throat> well, one of them, uh, this was, you know, we're literally moving decades now. Uh, she continued to pray for them, and uh, she did not give up. And there was one particular relative uh, that started getting up in years and still didn't know the Lord, and my mom did not quit. And um, I remember her calling me, and this has only been maybe about five years ago. I remember her calling me because of how excited she was that she had talked to him that day before, and he had come to know the Lord. All those prayers, I think it was 40 years she prayed for him. 40 years that she prayed for that uh, to take place. Now, that first prayer that she prayed is what started the process. It just that it took a little bit longer than some of the other ones. But eventually, we got the desired result. Yeah. And that's what we have to understand is when we're praying future prayers, it's, it, lots of times it's going to be outside of what we understand or what we even think is right. It's like, why should it have taken 40 years? I don't know, but I'm glad we got the result. Amen. And that's what matters. So when you're praying those future prayers, we need to understand that lots of times the process, when it brings that result, is going to be different in different situations. Excuse me here. You know, if you'd go to 1 John 5 for me, please, I want to share something else out of this. And this was one that also Pastor Steph had, had shared uh, last week. And it says, since we have this confidence, we can also have great boldness before him that if we ask anything agreeable to his will, and I love how she explained this, agreeable to his will, he will hear us. And she talked about as the more we pray that our will, our request was lining up with his will. That was, that was so powerful, that he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we also know that we have attained the request we ask of him. It doesn't say when we get it. It just says that we know when we pray that we're going to have the results that we want. Okay? Isn't that, man, that should be a boost of confidence for you. Because think about it. You're praying, and you know that answer's coming, and you know it's not there yet, but you know it's going to get there. Amen. If anything, that ought to boost your faith when you're praying. It's so important, and, you know, this is real basic, and I know that she had talked about this last week. We have to get to the point, first of all, where we're even praying about the situation. And second of all, where is our faith? Are we believing that our prayers are going to get results? Yes. Well, it says there, if our confidence is in him, when we pray, we know that we have the answer. You know, you take the example of Daniel, when it was 21 days to get the answer to that prayer. Thankfully, he didn't quit. He knew that the answer was coming. He just didn't know when, and, and it finally got there. So good. But he had the confidence from the beginning that what he was praying was going to get the result that he needed. Amen? Amen. Uh, if you could please go look at, um, let's go ahead and bring up Jeremiah 29, 11 also. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. I just want you to... Uh, you don't have to bring it up just yet. Let me talk about it for a second. You know, praying for something in the future, although we don't always see the result, 
And I'm talking about sometimes you may not see the result of it in your lifetime. Uh, lots of times you've begun the process, and I was, I was talking with Shauna about this and, and trying to get, because she had said something the other day, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I gotta go back and talk about that later. And so we talked about it some more last night. Lots of times when you're praying about something in the future, and I talked about how we start a process, what you're doing is you're taking that answer, and I'm not gonna try to go all weird on you here, you're taking that answer that's there for us in God's kingdom, and you're starting to bring it down to where we need it. Okay, do you understand that? We we, we were initiating that process, and like I said, we still don't know what it's going to get there, but when we start that process, we're pulling that answer, we're pulling that result our way to that prayer, okay? Jeremiah 29, 11, let's go ahead and bring it up now. It says, I know what I'm doing. This is God speaking. I have it all planned out. Think about that for a second. He has it all planned planned out. He's not having to come up with the answer as we're praying. He already has it all planned out. Everything is planned out. And it says plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you hope for. Plans to give you the future, what you're praying for, what you're hoping for. He's already got that planned out. Amen? Amen. So whatever you're praying for, it's not like he's having to get a few things together and say, okay, so if I do this, 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 and this, then that's going to be the answer they need. No, the answer is already there. But when we're praying, we're starting the process that's getting the answer to us. Okay, does everybody understand that? I, I, sorry, sometimes I slip into a teacher mode. I was a teacher for years, so I, I slip into the teacher mode. I mean, if I had a, a whiteboard behind me, I'd probably be writing on it by now. But I just want you to understand that what you're praying that the result is there and it's just waiting to get moved this way. Why? Because he already has it planned out. It's not haphazard, okay? All right, all right. Let me talk to you a little bit about the history of the church, okay? And I'll go somewhere with this in just a minute. Our church, like James said, was started in the mid-70s. We, uh, it started meeting in a hair salon and it grew from there. When my family came to this church, we were in a very old building in downtown Alvin. Uh, that building is over 100 years old now. And um, when we moved out here to this property, and I don't know, Pastor Judy could probably correct me on this, I remember us having prayer, and we still do this, we had prayer on Monday nights over in the first sanctuary that we had, which is now what we call Gym One at the school. And they would come together and pray, and I was asking my mom about this again yesterday, uh, just to kind of refresh my memory. And she said, yes, we would get in that room, and sometimes just walking around and praying, and we would come together to pray. And she said there was one time, I think she said it was almost 200 people in that room in a giant circle in the sanctuary praying. Well, they prayed for a lot of things. They prayed for our community. They prayed for our government. They prayed for healing for people in our church. And they also prayed that God would help us fulfill the plans that he had for our church. Now, God would speak through Pastor Al, and he would give Pastor Al dreams and visions, but the responsibility of the body of Christ is to pray that through. Yes. Pastor James and Steph can hear all they want to from God, but it's our job to help that make its way to us by praying it through, okay? We pray that they listen to God and they hear from God and that, um, that they are hearing the exact uh, instructions that he wants them to hear but we want to see the results too, right? We're part of this church. We're part of the body of Christ. So we want to help pray that through. Well, they started praying over these things years ago. You got to understand, what you see now was a lot smaller back then. We had five acres. And if you look at that building when you go out after church, that long part of the building before the breezeway, it was only about half of that building when we first moved out here. It was small. We had small beginnings. But those people started praying our first service, when we moved out here on this property, when we opened, we were at capacity. The church was packed out. So it's like, oh man, we already underplanned. You know, now the sanctuary is full. So we immediately had to start expanding. They had to add on to the rest of the building. Well, during that time, uh, God would show things to pass around. See, so we're also praying, God, please show us what your plans are for our church and how we're supposed to fulfill them. 
And that was a lot of plans. I know that one time that pastor shared many times from this pulpit about, it was a New Year's Eve, I don't even remember which year it was, where he said he needed a new dream and God talked to him about starting a Christian school and starting a Christian college. And what was the other thing? The camp, the starting the camp. Okay, I shouldn't remember, sorry. <laughs> Hello, the place I've been for 27 years and I forgot that one in it. Okay, thank you for fixing that. So those things were spoken to pastor a long time ago. Well, it wasn't like all that showed up in the next year. You know, Victory Camp was not started until 1992, and this was long before that. The school started almost immediately after that. We put things in place to start the school, started off very small, and then grew from there. But he was showing him all these things that were going to happen in the future. So if he spoke it to him, that means he already had it planned out, right? Why would God speak that dream to Pastor Al if he didn't already have it planned out? That wouldn't make any sense. But once we heard that and Pastor shared it with us, okay, now our job is to pray that through. So as we started praying, some of the things happened quickly, like, you know, we started the school, and then eventually we had the camp, and the other one was the college. Well, we have next now. And next, I mean, that took years for that to come into place, but look, it's here now. It's here and because of people praying and seeing off into the future, knowing that, look, I'm going to pray for this, and I may not even be here on earth when this answer comes, but I'm not going to quit praying about it. And those things have come to pass. That's praying for the future. If you think about it right now, the things that those people prayed for, you are the fruit of it. And what do you mean by that, Rod? Well, first of all, the building that you're sitting in, it took a lot of prayer to make this building happen. This was an incredibly expensive building, and you're building it. At that time, we started building it. Alvin was maybe 12 to 15,000 people. It's not normal that you build a building this big in a town that small. Okay, very unusual, very expensive. Uh, you know, I could go through stories of the miracles that God did to be able to finish this building. The pews that you're sitting in, it was a miracle how the money came in for that, you know, and different things that happened. But because of that and the way that they prayed that God would continue to expand our ministry and to grow our church, you are the fruit of that today. I'm the fruit of that today because I'm up here. Pastor Steph, who was little when that started, more than 30, a little bit more than 30, she is the result of those prayers. Now, it wasn't that people back then were praying, I can't wait till you raise up Pastor Steph to preach the gospel. No, people weren't praying that. They were praying that the young people of our church would find out the call of God on their life and they would fulfill it. And that's what happened. Those future prayers have come to pass. And uh, like I said, I've had a front row seat on all that. I love seeing that because I was a kid growing up in that and being able to see that and God just happened to have my plan be the one that I was going to stick around to see a lot of that. But a lot of that that came through here, I mean, we've had pastors that have come out of this church that have gone on to start their own. We've had people that have uh, gone into the business world and, and different areas because of the people praying for them that they would discover God while they were here and that their lives would be changed. Amen? Amen. Um, how many of you feel that you are the result of someone else's prayer. Raise your hand. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. You're saying, how can you be the result of somebody else's prayer? Excuse me for a minute. What I mean is there may be, you may have been in a point in your life where you were nowhere near what God had for you to do. You could have been going another direction. You could have been lost as could be. But there was somebody praying for you. Maybe it was a mom. You know, the classic case, of course, is always grandma's praying for you. Or somebody else that is praying for you that you would find God and you would find the plan for your life. I think everybody could raise their hand and say, at one point or another, you know, I'm the result of somebody else's prayer. Even if I knew the Lord from a young age, I still didn't know all of his plan. You know, there were people praying for that. I know my mom, I guess I can say this, hey, she's not here today. Uh, when she started praying for us as kids, she always obviously wanted us to do what God had called us to do. But I remember a couple times that she came to me 
And she said, you're going to preach someday. I said, Mom, leave me alone. I said, I don't want to preach. I don't even like talking in front of people, so just leave me alone. But she would continue to say this. So the, the, I remember the first, and, and at one point I thought, okay, God answered this because I'm teaching. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'm teaching in a Christian school, so that was it. That's all I got to do. Prayer was answered. Let's move on. You can go pray for something else. Well, then it got to the point where eventually I had spoken from this pulpit, and then my mom comes to me later and said, see, I told you so. And um, I guess I'm thankful that uh, at least God hears her when she prays about things, but it's like, yeah, mom, okay. I hope you're happy now. You got it. Okay. But uh, that was somebody that was praying for me that knew in the future that there was a plan that God had for me to fulfill that obviously I didn't understand at that time. I thought it was crazy, and, uh, but she didn't want to quit. And that's an example of you being the answer to somebody's prayer because somebody's willing to pray for your future and not give up. Now, obviously, you can say, well, that's your mom. She loves you. Uh, you're part of the family. But yeah, there's people that do that all the time for other people that they may not know very well. And uh, I'll give you another example of that. I'm sorry, my throat is really dry. I'm just uh, dried out, sorry, I've been taking an allergy pill, so I don't have much in my throat. Um, back when we started building the camp, um, the camp was not all built at one time. We had to build it in stages, and I'll tell you, at the beginning, it was, it was pretty rough. Uh, we started off with uh, our first camp over there, which is in November of 1992. We had a bale of hay, a tent, and one of those volleyball courts, you know, where you put the, the steel post inside of concrete inside of a tire to make the volleyball net, that's what we had. And then we, had a, we did have a small concession stand for hot chocolate, and it was built out of some plywood because this was a Thanksgiving weekend that year. And so uh, we had small beginnings like that, and we decided the next summer we were going to uh, start having camp. And uh, our first dorm, it wasn't even finished. As a matter of fact, um, the girls slept over in the student center, and the guys, some of us slept outside because it didn't even have doors on the dorms yet. Okay. You're sleeping outside, and it's June and July. What do you think is the problem with that? Mosquitoes. Oh, my gosh. We got some tables from the student center. I remember laying on a table trying to sleep, and it was, oh, it was terrible. It was so bad, they finally moved us in the gym over here. But we had really small beginnings. Well, one of the things we also did was, you know, we were doing a lot of this work ourselves, not just me. I wasn't even actually on staff then. I was just a volunteer. But we would have work days for the camp. And one of the things we did was we built the bunk beds. And so over there in the shop behind the school, we set up this massive assembly line. We had this big uh, saw for cutting plywood, and we would separate people in the teams, and we'd have work days on Saturdays. Okay, okay, y'all come out. We're going to start building. Somebody would be responsible for cutting the lumber. Somebody would be responsible for building the ladders from that. Somebody else would build the legs. Somebody else would assemble and put in the decking. Uh, we did all this ourselves. And that's 200 bunk beds, so 400 people can sleep there. It's a lot of bunk beds to build. I mean, it was amazing. And it was, the crazy thing was, we built the bunk beds, and the, we got the mattresses on them for like 85 bucks. Wow. Now, we can't even buy one mattress for the bunk beds at that price. It's just amazing. But um, as we built those bunk beds, and we started to move them out there to the dorms, we had these ladies that would go in there, because once we got them in the dorms, you had to go back and make sure everything was okay with the beds. Another thing we would do after that is they would go in and sand the beds and just put a light coat of sealer on there. And they would go through and do it all the beds. So as we started moving them to the dorms, these ladies would do that. Well, what these ladies were doing is they were not just going out there, sanding the beds a little bit and putting sealer on there. They would go up to those beds, and as they were doing that, they started praying over the beds. God, we pray that whoever lays in this bed is going to get a touch from you, that they're going to hear from you, that, God, you're going to speak into their life while they're at camp, and they're going to be changed. And they just started praying over that stuff. This is like 1993 and early 94. And uh, they started praying those things all that time back, all that almost 30 years ago. Those future prayers. There was not a camper on the property. We were still in the middle of building, but they started praying because they knew what was going to happen down the road. And as they were praying that and believing that, they started that process. So as these kids were coming to camp, they were changed. All right, so let me ask you something. 
how many of you, I'm going to ask this two or three questions, so as I ask this and you raise your hand, I want you to keep your hand up. How many of you have slept in one of those beds at camp and your life has been changed while you were at camp? Raise your hand and keep it up. Okay? How many of you know somebody, whether it was your own child or a relative or somebody else, that came to camp and they were touched and they were changed? Look at all, I want you to keep those hands up. I want you to look around and see that. This is future prayers right here. Those things that they were praying, we're seeing the fruit of it in here today. Because I can look at a lot of these people that raise their hands, and I know most of you, and think about how God changed your life at camp. How you were never the same after that. And lots of people that were changed at camp, they now have kids at our camp that are coming, and they're going to get changed. And a lot of those that were changed, they're now doing things that are changing other people's lives because of how they were affected at camp. So thank God for the little ladies that were sanding and sealing the beds, right? Now, how does that apply to you today? We talked about how you've been, how you've heard about future prayers of somebody praying for you and how you were changed and how it affected your life and eventually affected your family. I think about like when my mom was praying for my dad. If my dad hadn't come to know the Lord, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what direction our family would have gone. I, I don't know what that would have done. If you read the statistics, it's so important when the, the leader of the household is a godly leader. And uh, I'm so thankful for the man that led my dad to the Lord because those two went on to do years and years of ministry together. Not full-time ministry, but touching other people's lives. They both came. My dad was a witness till the day he, he left this earth, just witnessing to people. And um, you think about how people prayed for you and you were changed, but how does that apply to you now praying for somebody else? What can you do to, pre, to uh, with a future prayer that's going to affect somebody else's life? You know, if you think about it, just because you were changed by what somebody did, that was just one step in the process. How many have heard of pay it forward before? How many of you have done that in a uh, drive through line before? I love doing that. There's one teacher at our school. I got her twice on that. She got so mad because she couldn't get in line behind me uh, to pay me back for it. But isn't it so neat how lots of times you'll hear about how that starts? It pays for one person, then the person, they pay for the person behind them, and it, and it starts this chain. You know, it's just something, you know, it's not a big deal. You're just paying for somebody's meal, but it's a blessing to them. I mean, it, it blesses them, and you got to remember, anytime you're praying, the person that you're praying for or the thing you're praying for is not the only thing that gets blessed. You get blessed at the same time. Like Pastor Steph was saying, when we're praying for God's will, it's aligning our will with his at the same time. And it opens those doors of blessing for us. So even when you're praying a future prayer that's way down the road, it doesn't just affect them, it affects you. You know, I, I'm going to put my daughter on the spot for a second here. Sorry, Bay. You know, obviously, as a parent, I've prayed for her since before she was born. Prayed that God's going to use her. She's going to be really smart, all those kind of things that you want to pray for, <laughs> that you want to pray as a parent. And that most of all, that she's going to love the Lord and do exactly what he's called her to do. Well, I can tell you this, uh, Bailey is very smart. She won't tell you this, but she actually started school a year early because she tested so well. Uh, she graduated barely at 17 years old. She had her bachelor's by the time she was 19. She's now working on her master's, and she will have graduated by the time she is 22 years old. And just thoroughly embarrassed her. The reason I'm saying that is, you know, when we prayed, we believed that God was going to answer our prayers. And those prayers were 21 years ago. And God is still doing them today. And when you're praying something forward, what you're doing is you're starting a process that's going to touch somebody else's life. And then you're believing that that's going to touch somebody else after that. Let's go back to what I said at the beginning. Our prayers never die. Like Ian Bounds said, I love how he said that. Our prayers are deathless. 
what we're speaking, lots of times it may happen long after we're gone, but it's gonna happen, amen? So what can you do to pray it forward for somebody else today? Well, one of our things we believe in is raising up leaders in the next generation. And like I said, I see people in here today that I remember when they were very young and God is raising them into the leader that they are now. And now it's their turn to pray it forward for somebody else. Let me tell you something. All you've worked for me at camp, raise your hand. They are already praying for the next generation. They're already ministering to the next generation. So it's not like they said, okay, when I turn 21, I'll start praying about it. No, we have showed them that, look, people were praying for you to be changed. Now it's your turn. So as we pray it forward and cause this process just to continue, remember, this is perpetual. Prayer is perpetual. It's just ongoing and ongoing. We're kickstarting the process. God's making it happen. As you're praying it forward, we continue to grow and expand the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. That's what he's called us to do. He wants us to do that. You know, if you think about your, your job as a parent, you want things to be better for your kids than they were for you. Uh, my dad grew up in a house that had no indoor plumbing. I remember going to that house when I was young up in Ohio. And uh, they had uh, an outhouse. Now, think about having an outhouse in Ohio in January. He said, sometimes you couldn't go to the outhouse at night because if it was a blizzard, you could get lost trying to get back to the house. I haven't had anything close to that kind of problem, okay? <laughs> we didn't have a house like that. But what he, the reason I'm saying that is he wanted our lives to be so much better than his. So my mom and dad worked really, really hard so that we would have a life that was better than what they went through. And not just economically, but spiritually. Like I said, my mom and dad, they didn't come to know the Lord until they were into their 20s. And they said, we do not want that for our children. We want them to know the Lord now because we want them to be able to fulfill everything he's called them to do and not miss out on some of those years like we did. So as you're praying it forward, think about that. You know, we don't want the best for just the people around us, not just physically, but we want the best spiritually, just like a parent does. So when you're praying for them, you're praying that God is not only gonna take care of their needs here on earth, he's gonna fulfill the plans that he has for their life. I think about that every time when we're at camp and we're praying for those kids and we start praying for them months in advance. Our leadership team, we usually meet in January. We start praying about the summer at that time and we don't even know who the kids are that are coming to camp yet but we start praying for them. God, we pray that every kid that comes on this campus is gonna be touched by you. Show us how to minister to them. Show us what we can do to connect them with you. And every year, every year without fail, we have kids that come to know the Lord. I mean, it's just awesome to see. I think about the ones now that are, are grown up and moved away and they have families. I know there's one in particular that went to our camp for several years and served as an intern, and he's a pastor now in Virginia. And um, so I get to see some of his uh, messages and stuff he shared. It's just awesome. But he was one of those that came, God imparted to him, and he, now he's, I mean, he's ministering to people all over. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to pray it forward. Our future prayers are gonna go way past us. The people that started this church and have gone on, they were wanting to see stuff like this. I think if they would see this, it would put a smile on their face. Look what God's done. But at the same time, we haven't reached the end. We're not at a stopping point, okay? I want you to understand that this is not a plateau that we're at. This is, this is just merely a point if you look at it, and it's not even a line. It's more like a, if anybody knows what a, uh, an exponential curve looks like on a graph, it's not linear. It doesn't go straight across. It actually swings up. Sorry, it's my math lesson for today. It, there's, a, there's an increase to that curve that you don't just see things going up little by little. They tend to accelerate, and that's what I believe that God is doing in our church today. As we pray for those things in the future, that it's not just, oh, yeah, we're just cruising along this feet. No, he is accelerating things. He is doing things faster than we could do them. When it says that he does anything that's more than we could ask or think, the reason is we can only think up so much stuff. I mean, the mind has a great imagination, but there's still only so much stuff that we can think up and then pray to match that. So you know, his word said that he goes beyond that. Yes. He's like, okay, that was a good prayer, and I know that really stretched your faith, but I've got more than that that I'm gonna go ahead and give you. So That's the way that he does it. So when we're praying for those things in the future, we can't, we can't predict what that's gonna be or what it's gonna look like 
or when it's going to happen. But that's what he does for us. He makes things so great. He just makes it where when we get done with that and you've prayed for something, you see results like, man, God did that. I can believe for even more next time. Wow, what a powerful message. I pray that it blesses you as much as it blessed me. We always want to give you an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing here at LS Church. There's always something going on from kids to youth, all kinds of crazy stuff. So if you do want to give, text LS Church to 77977, or you can head to our website, lschurch.tv. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week.